Hello! In this video, we are going to prove the following theorem. Suppose c is non-zero. Then, the limit as x approaches c of 1 over x is equal to 1 over c. Now really, we're dealing with the limit of a function. What function exactly? Well, we can perform 1 over x for any non-zero real number x. So we'll say that the function we're dealing with is the function f from the set of non-zero real numbers to the real numbers defined by f of x equals 1 over x. The whole goal is to prove this limit. And by the epsilon delta definition of a limit, this means the following. It means for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all x in the domain of our function, if zero is less than absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, then absolute value of one over x minus one over c is less than epsilon. So to prove this limit, all we got to do is prove that this statement is true. Now, since we're trying to prove a statement about all epsilon greater than zero, give me an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. From here, we want to find a delta greater than zero, which makes this statement turn out true. Now, let's pretend as though we've already figured out what to choose delta to be. And with this choice of delta, we want to show that this statement is true. And since we're trying to prove a statement about all x in the domain of our function, give me an arbitrary x in the domain of our function. And from here, we want to show if this is true, then this is true. So let's suppose that this is true. From here, we want to show that this is true. So let me start off by writing the left-hand side of this inequality. The whole goal is to make this guy less than epsilon. And in the process of doing so, we're going to figure out what we should choose delta to be. OK, now to start, let's combine these two guys into a single fraction. To do that, we'll multiply the numerator and denominator of the first fraction by c, and we'll multiply the numerator and denominator of the second fraction by x. And then combining these two together, this is just c minus x over cx. And then a property of absolute values tells us we can split this up into the absolute value of the numerator over the absolute value of the denominator. And we know that the absolute value c minus x is equal to the absolute value of x minus c. I'm going to rewrite the numerator as absolute value of x minus c because, well, that's what we have here. And also, we can split up absolute value cx into absolute value c times absolute value of x. Okay, so at this point, we have re-expressed this guy equivalently as this. Now, we know that the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta. So, this guy must be less than delta over the absolute value of c times absolute value of x. Okay, but what should we do from here? Well, maybe we should start thinking about how we should define delta. Now, a trick we can use to define delta is to define delta so that delta is the smallest number in a list of positive numbers. In other words, we're going to restrict delta so that delta is less than or equal to a list of positive numbers. So what should be the first positive number we pick to restrict delta? Well, we're going to pick a positive number so that absolute value of x is greater than a particular value. If we can do that, then we'll be able to take this guy and get rid of the absolute value of x. And that should get us closer to making this guy less than epsilon, which is what we want. OK, now to see which positive number we should pick, let's consider the graph of 1 over x. And for the sake of demonstration, let's suppose that c is greater than 0. So we'll say arbitrarily that c is right here. Now, if we restrict delta, so that delta is less than or equal to c over 2, 
Then we have that absolute value of x minus c is less than delta, which is less than or equal to c over 2. So this tells us that the absolute value of x minus c must be less than c over 2. And all that means is that the farthest away that x can be from c is c over 2. So this is the farthest to the left x can be from c. And this is the farthest to the right x can be from c. So with this restriction on delta, we have that x must lie somewhere in this interval. So no matter what x is, we see that the absolute value of x must be greater than c over 2. So in the case where c is greater than 0, if we restrict delta to be less than or equal to c over 2, we should expect absolute value of x to be greater than c over 2. We get a similar setup in the case where c is less than 0. In that case, we would instead restrict delta to be less than or equal to the negative of c over 2. And we should expect absolute value of x to be greater than the negative of c over 2. To account for both cases, all we got to do is restrict delta to be less than or equal to the absolute value of c over 2. And we should expect absolute value of x to be greater than the absolute value of c over 2. So using the fact that we're restricting delta to be less than or equal to the absolute value of c over 2, let's show that absolute value of x must then be greater than absolute value of c over 2. Since delta is less than or equal to the absolute value of c over 2, we know that the absolute value of x minus c must then be less than the absolute value of c over 2. Now, we want to bring absolute value of x into our work. And to do that, we can use the reverse triangle inequality. If we recall, the absolute value of the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of c is less than or equal to the absolute value of x minus c. And because this is true, we have that this guy must be less than absolute value of c over 2. And this is equivalent to saying that absolute value of x minus absolute value of c must lie somewhere between the negative of absolute value of c over 2 and absolute value of c over 2. And now, focusing on this inequality, if we add absolute value of c to the other side, we get that absolute value of x is greater than absolute value of c over 2, which is exactly what we expected. So, with the restriction that delta is less than or equal to absolute value of c over 2, we showed that we had that absolute value of x is greater than a particular value. The reason why this is useful is because we can use this to get rid of the absolute value x that we have here. And to see how, well, since these guys are both positive, if we take the reciprocal of both sides of these inequality, then we get that 1 over the absolute value of x is less than 2 over the absolute value of c. If we multiply delta on both sides of this inequality, we get that delta over absolute value of x is less than 2 delta over absolute value of c. And then multiplying 1 over absolute value of c on both sides of this inequality results in this. But then we know that absolute value of c times absolute value of c is equal to c squared. So this guy must be less than 2 delta over c squared. And let's remember, the whole goal was to make this guy less than epsilon. So let's restrict delta to be less than or equal to another positive number. Well, all we got to do is restrict delta to be less than or equal to 1 half epsilon c squared. If we do that, well then, this guy must be less than or equal to 2 times 1 half epsilon c squared over c squared. 
and this just simplifies down to epsilon. And so we have made this guy less than epsilon. All we have to do is define delta so that delta is the smaller of this number and this number. So now let's put this all together to make sure we have proven this statement. We see that under the assumption x is an element of the domain of our function, we have if this is true, then this guy is less than epsilon. Since x is arbitrary, this means we have shown for all x in the domain of our function. If this is true, then this guy is less than epsilon. So we have found a value for delta, which makes this statement turn out true. And so we have shown that this is true. And we showed that this is true under the assumption of some arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. Since epsilon was arbitrary, this means we have shown for all epsilon greater than zero, this is true. So we have proven this entire statement, which means we have proven the limit. And so this completes the proof. And so yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.